Now, you've been looking at the dividend to medical science of, uh, I suppose, the rush to, to combat COVID-19. So talk me through some of the terrific developments. That's right, yeah. I mean, it's amazing in some ways. Remember, all this science has happened in the past two years. All these discoveries have been made about the immune system and vaccines and all sorts, which we didn't know before, you know. And now in medicine, we're saying this could give rise to lots of progress in many different ways. It's a bit like the uh, the moonshot gave rise to things, didn't it? You know, And the first one, most of all, is vaccine obviously because these wonderful fantastically new of course still new vaccines are so powerful and they're called genetic vaccines they've now been named that you're using the gene you see as opposed to the protein or the or the whole virus and the RNA vaccines are genetic in, in nature you know and they've proven themselves in, in spades basically haven't they with this massive effectiveness so now as we speak Pat there's vaccine trials running for HIV malaria and several types of cancer using that technology you see Brilliant. so again I'm especially optimistic this morning because some of the cancer ones are looking very promising. Now this is early days of course the, dr- the dream was always to vaccinate against cancer so the, the immune system would kill the tumour you know and there was some evidence that might work in the past but now using this RNA technology that dream is getting more and more of a reality so, so in some ways we're looking at a very bright future for, for lots of different diseases based on what was discovered through COVID. So that's uh, the first great development, uh, something that was long coming uh, because they were experimenting on this, uh, you were telling me, some 30 years ago, but now they have refined it and they know how to do it. Uh, So the next thing, wearable tech, lots of people wearing Fitbits and stuff like that. How does that play into disease diagnosis? Yeah, it was obvious in a way because we are all measuring our sleep patterns, aren't we, in various things, using our our smartphones and so on, our watches and things like that. They've been deployed to study COVID a lot. And and so, for example, they, they gave smartwatches to people with COVID and monitored symptoms that often got loads of data from that and it's kind of it's proven itself as a diagnostic indicator first of all so in other words you may spot disease early using this technology and th- this idea had been around before of course but yet again because of COVID everything got ramped up in this regard you know and there's several studies now showing you can use smart watches there's, there's things called smart rings you put a ring in your finger that detects your pulse rate it can detect your temperature all these various things can be measured and now they've improved basically the way to do that and the prediction there is we'd all be wearing these devices to, to measure our health in, in a more effective way. As I say, it was, it was happening before, as you may remember, people had this anyway, you know. But because of COVID, that technology has improved and gone fast as well. And so, so wearable technology could become a key feature for all our lives and you'll spot disease early. And as you know, Pat, if, if you can spot any disease quickly, you can intervene quickly then, you know. And that's always been a dream for medicine anyway, the diagnostic thing. So, yeah. so again, wearable tech has come up usually as well in the past two years. Yeah, you wonder though will people be objecting that Big Brother is watching them well, Big yeah. Brother knows my temperature Big Brother knows my pulse that's the trouble yeah this data has to be private another one good one Pat was long COVID can be measured with this tech they reckon now as well there's a study showing that if you know if, if you get long COVID because of fatigue your your smartphone goes take a rest and that can relieve some of the symptoms so again it might be a way to manage symptoms in long COVID and of course as you know Pat long COVID is one of our concerns now now that we're passing out of the, the pandemic phase so if you get if you if you could limit the symptoms of long COVID using wearable tech, that could be another useful add-on. Now, there's a new way to discover drugs. Um, what is that? There is, yeah. And this is another really good example of things speeding up because of COVID in a way. And what it's all about is if you have a disease, it's often caused by a broken protein in your body of some kind. So the protein starts to, to, to malfunction, as it were. And a good example is in breast cancer, the BRCA protein is defective in certain types of breast cancer. And then they'd fire drugs at BRCA. That, that was known before COVID, of course. But they've realised that in the case of BRCA, it interacts with probably 30, 40 different proteins. It's a network of proteins. And so the question is, can you bring the network down was the idea before. Now COVID is the same. They've discovered that the COVID proteins interact with networks and using that information then you can design drugs to bring the whole network down and have a very efficacious drug and there's a couple of drugs in, in phase three trials for COVID that target the network that's happened, the protein network as it were is being targeted. You know, Now what that means is many diseases involve networks of proteins that are dysfunctional and a drug that targets the network might be more effective then than a drug that t- targets one component. So if you like it's a new way to discover drugs based on again what we learned from COVID is the there. Now, uh, the scientists have found 69 compounds that influence the proteins in the coronavirus network and... 29 of them already have FDA approval for other things. That's exactly right. So there was drugs already in humans that could treat the, some proteins in the network for COVID that were already safe, you see. And they get redeployed now into the COVID situation. So again, it just shows you that wouldn't have been discovered if the network wasn't discovered, if you know what I mean. So the key thing there was network discovery first, and then a drug that's on the shelf can now be redeployed, is the idea.
Yeah, there's one called Aplidin, uh, currently being used to treat cancer. Yeah, and it that's turns right. Out, it far better than remdesivir. Yeah, it was 27 times more effective than remdesivir in a test tube. You know, which is a great effect, really. So uh, that that's brilliant. So new ways of uh, actually f- developing or reapplying existing drugs to the treatment of uh, various illnesses. I mean, we're talking about COVID nineteen, but any particular thing, you map that uh, the extensive protein network yeah. and off you go. <clears throat> exactly. You bring the whole network down basically and that's a more effective way to treat diseases. Now again, cancer is a great example about that. That's often networks of proteins all malfunctioning together as opposed to a single protein. So therefore the goal is to bring the network down and have an effect. So again, we might see progress in cancer uh, therapies as well through, through the work that came out of COVID. Now, we've often heard of clinical trials and uh, we're told that this drug X or that drug Y are very expensive because they've had to conduct clinical trials. They've got to persuade uh, the FDA in the United States and the European Medicines Agency that these drugs are safe to be deployed in humans uh, and they have to, you know, recruit loads and loads of people, do the tests and all the rest. There is a smarter way. There is. Now, Now again, this is this may be the biggest thing put after the vaccines, actually, to be honest, a better way to do clinical trials. So uh, with, with COVID, there was a thing called the recovery trial in the UK. They tested four different drugs at the same time against COVID using groups of patients, right? And one of them worked, dexamethasone, you may remember, that's a steroid that was proven to work from that trial. And, and it was a, they're called large, simple trials. All you're measuring is, say, survival, something quite straightforward, you know. In other words, they simplified the whole trial process down. And now they're wondering, well, let's make every trial like this. So for example, if you have a drug, say for Parkinson's disease, why not try three drugs at the same time? Maybe one is going to work, you know? And the trial is much quicker. It's cheaper because you're not measuring. At the moment, there's an obsession in trials to measure everything you can and loads of data that mightn't be that useful. If you have a simple, what's called an endpoint, it can be done much more straightforwardly, you know? And several drug companies now have spotted this and they're saying, we have to reform the way we do clinical trials for the diseases that we're, we're trying to a, a test our new medicines against, you know. So again, that that's an example of, of, of a radical change that might come in a way in the way clinical trials are run in a much simpler, more efficient way. In other words, COVID, it was like necessity is the mother of invention. It was an emergency that simplified the clinical trial process down and then they find dexamethasone, you know. So that can be now deployed, that, that protocol, if you like, across multiple diseases. So there's big talk at the moment of much quicker, much cheaper trials and it's great for patients because then we get the medicines more quickly, don't we, under the, under the marketplace, as it were, by simplifying the whole process. So again, we see that one as another key development. Mm. Uh, What about side effects? You know, okay, um, I don't die of COVID because I've taken this drug and I'm I'm feeling fine uh, because the simple question is, does he die or does he not? Yeah. Um, But then like three weeks later, I develop a boil on my backside and that's down to the drug or whatever. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, that's an important one because that could be a numbers game because the more people you have on the trial, the more likely you'll see a side effect, say. But again, they've got ways of controlling that and and getting the numbers such that you can reveal any any side effect. There'll be a minimum number of people probably needed, you know, on a trial anyway, just to check for side effects. But again, that can be built into the thing. But that, that will be one issue that they'll be looking at as well.